slides will be starting in just rather few minutes. They have already been joined by the speaker, who is Dr. Mukesh Bajaj. Good morning, Dr. Dr. Nikesh. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Dr. Nikesh. So it's good afternoon here, but for you it's good morning. Good morning. That's why I said good morning. And good afternoon to all our participants. I think we can start now. It's 30. A very good afternoon to one and all. A very warm welcome to this last session of the PT, which is themed on recent advances in computer science and the life of us. Heartiest congratulations and heartiest welcome to our guest and speaker, Dr. Nikesh Pagas from the University of East London. UK. Guys, hope you, uh, you all have enjoyed the session so far, and we are now trying to close, the, uh, close to the end of this activity. With this, let me now introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Nikesh Pagar, and he is a postdoctoral research fellow in machine learning and signal processing with University of East London, UK. He did his MTech in CIS from Aligarh Muslim University, Aligarh. He completed his PhD from Queen's Mary University, London, and University of Geneva, Italy, under the joint PhD program. He also served as an assistant professor in Queen's Mary University. He has also worked with the data study group at Alan Turing Institute. Prior to his current assignment, he started his career as an assistant professor with lovely professional university, Fagwala, Punjab, and worked there for more than five years. He has also worked for more than two years in Kegel as Kegler and has two years of experience as CCO in Caldwell and Selma. With this, may I now request and invite Dr. Rakan Mukesh to kindly take over and address the audience. Today he's going to speak on FIAT physiology of auditory attention to speech. Dr. Nikesh, may I request to kindly take over? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as I said, my name is Nikesh Bajaj, and uh, uh, I think he already explained about everything about me. So I'll just start with the, with the presentation. So this presentation is all about my PhD work that uh, we worked on uh, auditory attention. And uh, the whole idea was to detect the auditory attention from the physiological signals. So I'll, I'll start with that ex, uh, in, in detail. So the presentation, I'll just start with the little bit of review of machine learning and deep learning because we will be using the terms. So just to make sure that everybody knows these terms. So I wouldn't go in detail just to give you the idea that what are the fundamental that we might need. And then I'll start with what is auditory attention? What is the pro pro proper pro uh, problem that we worked on? How we designed the experiment, design procedure and conduction of our Experiment. This is all very important for to understand the problem because uh, when you, if you start working on this data and this kind of problem, you will know that how we design a problem and how we collect the data and uh, uh, what kind of problem that you can actually uh, solve with this this data set. Then, then uh, I'll describe about the whatever the, all the collected data set that we collect uh, we have. And the formulation of the predictive task, we, we formulated four predictive tasks out of this uh, work. And then I'll, I'll talk about the signal processing and pre-processing of the signals that we, we used for this. And we proposed some of the algorithms for uh, artifact removal. And then I'll, I'll show you the one uh, experiment, uh, the results for one experiment of uh, doing all the predictive tasks with SVM deep learning and uh, I'll conclude and before even conclusion, I'll uh, show you how to do it by your own. So all the code and all the data sets is available online and you can simply download it and uh, run it. 
Uh, I'll show you the links and uh, we'll go through the tutorial where you can actually see how you can download and install and start with that, uh, this all predictive task that we will discuss here. So uh, just for the overview of uh, machine learning and deep learning, uh, I think uh, I saw the first presentation where uh, uh, Professor, uh, he explained about the machine learning and deep learning and ev almost everything. So I, I hope that everybody understand now that in machine learning, the problem that we have is we have X and we want to find the function by which we can map X to Y and uh, by minimizing the, so I'll show you here, by minimizing the uh, some loss function for unseen data. So that, that's the whole problem of the machine learning that we have. Uh, in supervised learning, we have two kinds of pl problem, classification and regression. Classification where we have the label is, uh, uh, labels are the classes of uh, some, some category. And in regression, we have the real time numbers uh, range from some number to some, some, uh, some value to some. For performance measure, uh, for classification, usually we go with accuracy and for regression, we go for mean square error or mean absolute error. Uh, I, I hope that you understand what is decision tree, how it works and what is SVM, how it works. And I'm, I, I also, hope that you understand what is fully connected neural network also known as the multiple uh, uh, multi multi layer uh, perceptron and uh, convolutional neural network so we, we we might need all these terms to understand the problem so that's why i'm just hoping that you all understand it already so uh, when i go for the introduction uh, Okay, one more thing that if you have any question in between, I, I would uh, expect you to ask there and there because if you wait till end, there will be a lot of thing by uh, going over that. So it's better to ask. Yeah, Dr. Vitesh, actually we don't allow people to unmute themselves. So what we will do, we, uh, they will write their question in the chat section and okay. I will keep taking the question for you. Sir. Okay, all right, that, that's good. Yeah. yeah, so I, I just wanted to make sure that they, if, if there is any question or doubt, they should ask right yeah. now. I, then... I will read it. I will read it and then you can answer the question. Yeah, okay. That, that's great. Sure. All right. So when we talk about the auditory attention, uh, and uh, attention is a, one of the field from cognitive psychology. And according to that, attention is a cognitive process of selectively focusing on a discrete aspect of information while ignoring all the other uh, received information. So that's how our brain works. Brain just focus only one of the part and just uh, discard everything else. So uh, it's, a, it's a very complex process of a brain and uh, psychologists and neurologists, they have been working on this uh, and trying to understand how brain works. Uh, it was started with the first problem that uh, was faced in World War II that fighter planes, they were uh, listening the perfectly audible message on their headphones and still weren't paying attention on it due to some reason. So they started working on that, that why it happened. So there, the history of auditory attention goes way beyond till World War II. So from there people have like, there have been so many experiments and so many theory about the attention, how our brain works and what are the mechanism of the uh, brain that we, we use for the attention. Uh, attention has been divided basically into two category, auditory attention and visual attention. But there's one more, which is task oriented attention. It's kind of a combination of both plus some motor skills. And uh, the theories that uh, we have for attention, auditory attention is, uh, it's called filter theory, early selection theory, and late selection theory, and cognitive load theory. So what filter theory says that uh, how brain filter out the one information over other, and early selection says, early selection theory says that first we uh, select the information that we want to process, and then we process it. However, late selection theory says that we process everything that comes into the mind, 
and then we select what we want to focus on. So it's kind of a contradictory theory. And uh, there was there's a one cognitive load theory which kind of combined these two aspects together. So these two theory, early selection and late selection theory, have been for decades and a lot of evidence for both of the theories. But then cognitive load theory, it's kind of a very recent. Uh, they uh, in this theory they explain that how both thing can happen, early selection and late selection. It depends on the cognitive load. So if what you are processing if all the information that is coming to your brain is too much then you will not process everything you will just select first and then process that's uh, early selection but if the information load is not much which we call it cognitive load then you process everything and then select one so that's that's what is the cognitive load theory uh in in this field, widely used experiment is called dichotic listening task to evaluate the auditory attention. It, its example is like here. So here we have a subject and we, are, we have uh, two auditory uh, messages, one here and another here, two different messages. So this subject is being uh, uh, given two messages and at the last, uh, we try to know that what message he actually uh, received properly. So that's, that's why it is called dichotic listening task because there are two messages and just to understand where uh, attention lies and what depends on, uh, like how it depends on the things. So that, that these are the theories and uh, so whole problem from this theory comes uh, for this this particular project of Fiat is uh, that does auditory attention modulates our physiology. Physiology means when we are paying attention, our, does your heart rate increases or decreases, or your skin condition increases or decreases, or does it modulate in, in any way? Or even if it, it does, can we estimate the auditory attention from these signals? So this is the main problem that we started tackling on. So we designed one experiment based on dichotic listening tasks. Unlike dichotic listening tasks, we didn't provide two messages. So this is, this is a mod model of our experiment. So we have a listener and uh, he's provided uh, auditory message. Now auditory message is only one, but it's, it has a different auditory condition. So it has a different noise, background noise, semanticity and length of the message. So, so example for the messages were the kind of messages that we provided were, I'm going to study and I would like to read some books. These are semantically correct sentences. So these kind of messages with different background noise and another kind of messages like, uh, let's touch enjoyable go. So these are non-semantic messages. Like this sentence does not make any sense because uh, this particular, these two words are in between uh, just let's go one, one semantic sentence. Similarly for this, uh, I have a, it, the original sentence was I have a big dog but when you introduce some, some word which are not into the picture, like hey, are we, this complete sentence become non-semantic. So that's how we generated non-semantic stimuli from semantic one, just to see that uh, does attention, do we lose attention when we hear any word which does not fit into the context? So that was the semanticity. We had a background noise also, minus six dB, three dB, zero dB, three dB, six dB, and infinity means no noise at all. So we have six different level of noise, semanticity we just discussed, and length of the sentence. So short, medium, and long sentences. Short sentences are as short as uh, only four words per sentence. And medium are eight words per sentence and uh, long sentences are 12 words per sentence. So still we are not going too long sentences just to avoid the memory and capacity and mechanism of the brain. And uh, with this, after this experiment, so in this experiment, listener is listening one of the audio file 
with different auditory condition. And after that, he has to write what he heard. That's, we call it shadowing. And from the transcribed sentence, we calculate the attention level that how many words were correctly identified. And we calculate attention level from zero to 100. From let's say if out of 12 words, only uh, four words were correctly identified then four by 12 becomes 30%. So that's how we calculated that uh, attention. While whole experiment, we collected three different physiological signals, EEG, electroencephalograph, PPG is a photoplexismogram, which is closely related to EEG, ECG, kind of a heart rate, and GSR, which is a galvanic skin response, which uh, measure your skin conductance. So these three signals we uh, uh, recorded, and you can see here is a picture of that. So these are the first 14 EEG signal. This is a GSR, and this is a PPG. It looks like a heart rate. So it's, it's a close approximation of heart rate. So this was the whole experiment design. And uh, we conducted experiment with 25 non-native speakers. Uh, why non-native? There were big discussion why we want to go with the non-native and native. So here non-native means people whose first language is not English. And all the sentences and stimuli we had were English sentences. So we just wanted to make sure that it's not very trivial job for uh, native speakers. So we used uh, 25 subjects, uh, all had different nationalities and different first languages. Age range was from 16 to 35. There were 21 male and four females. And each subject went through 144 trials. So one trial looks like that. So if you look at the setting of the one trial, so subject is given a computer interface where he has to press a button to start a listening task. And when he listens to task, when it ends, he has a time to write it. So it time depends on that subject, how much time it takes to write it. And then when he writes, he writes complete the writing task and he press the button to submit then this gap is labeled as resting. Okay, and this, press interrupt you for a moment. So yeah. yeah. Actually, there, I can see there are two questions in the chat section from the Pucham Prakash. If you permit me, yeah. can I read it? There are two buttons. No, no, no. There are two questions which I can see in the chat section. If you permit me, okay. I can read one. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, the first question is how early selection is different from prediction? Okay, early selection depends on prediction. Uh, so, well, early how selection. It, yeah, the question is like, how is it different from prediction? How it is different from prediction? Yeah. I don't understand the question properly. I, I, I don't understand that. Are you saying that, do we do prediction before early selection or? No, the question written is like, uh, how so, early selection is different from prediction. Okay, so, well, it is entirely different because we are still not talking about prediction yet. We are talking about how, uh, so if I go back to this early selection and late selection theories. So early selection theory is a theory which says how brain works. So these theories are that how brain works for uh, and select the messages in the atmosphere uh, around you to pay attention. So early selection theory says that we select first, let's say that there are uh, 10 messages coming in. We first select which we want to uh, focus on and then we, uh, then we process it and then we focus it. Like then we process it means we are focusing on it, right? So in brain mechanism, there are uh, first we select the message and then we decode it like message decoding, which uh, the all the phonemes come to your brain and your brain try to interpret every information. That That's a decoding and that's a processing. So first we select it and then we process it or first we process all the information that comes or then we select which one we want to focus on. So the, that's, that was early selection and late selection. 
still here there is no context of prediction because still we are just talking about how brain work for the attention mechanism so there is no no prediction here yet and the second question, question. Yeah. and the second question is why we need auditory attention what is the area or scope of this way okay so yeah it's a very interesting question that what are the application of this particular problem so first uh, is uh, that we will understand that how brain works and how where we pay attention if we understand that then there are many many applications of that for example if we understand that i'll i'll show you some finding according to that finding from this study we have some of the suggestion that how we can improve the message delivery so let's say that uh, now we have some findings out of it so because we understand that how attention works auditory attention in non native speaker works so we have some finding and which helps us to talk to non native so let's say if i am uh, british and i talk to people who are not british or who do not have their first language as english then how should i talk to them so that they pay attention properly and when what happens in the speech or my language which then shift their attention that that's a one of the one of the uh, application which which can be applied in many area like in teaching if you are teaching to uh, if you let's say are a british or english person teaching to non native speaker which is now there's a very very common scenario every international school and colleges they have the international stu students so they are not english at all and english people if they are teaching how they should teach like what are the factor that affects auditory attention of these students that that's an one, one application in in teaching another application that we actually we started with the one of the intention of the application for this this particular project was that if we if we can understand the if we can understand the uh, auditory attention or if we can estimate the auditory attention from physiological signals only we can understand that okay when people's attention is going down and according to that we can change the interface so for example let's say there is a game and somebody is playing a, a playing a game and that the scenario of the game which is the difficulty level and everything can change according to the person's attention level or if you are playing a video let's say a tutorial or the uh, video lectures for somebody that video lecture will, the playing speed of the video lecture and the detail content of the video lecture will be controlled by the attention of the person so if you can't tell them that okay you have to go back it can be controlled automatically so that's that's one area which is called the brain computer interface so possibly there were two two branches of this area one is the psychology which is completely the one field where we just need to know that how it works and another with the physiological signal it's a brain computer interface thing so where there are other kind of applications where we can explore that where we want to use the attention and to control some of the things so what do we feel now that uh, most probably we see the question and the second is the last so that it is sorry i think disturb you in this thing uh, i i or as you say mm -hmm. If you so, feel comfortable in answering questions in between, then we will, I will keep reading it to the uh, to you. Otherwise, we can do it the last. It's it's fine. It's fine to ask a question in between. I I perfectly feel okay. So sure, sure. it's fine. Okay. So should I continue? Yeah. Please, please. so we saw the experimental design and in experimental design we have three auditory condition noise level semanticity and length of the stimulus and uh, we calculated auditory attention the way i just explained it and we collected three different signal eeg gsr and pg we conducted with 25 people every subject was gone through 144 trial which is a kind of a combination of all the experimental condition that different noise level different semanticity and different length average time for one subject was 40 minute plus and minus 10 minutes so we have easy recording of 40 plus minus 10 minutes for every subject 
EEG, PPG, and GSR, all of them. So this is the one trial, as I explained, that so there are three tasks, listening, writing, and resting. This includes one trial. So, and then we go to the next trial for every subject. Uh, the collected data set, if I like, so th this is uh, kind of a snapshot of the whole collected data set. So these are the 14 signals, uh, like 14 EEG signal, then GSR, and then PPG. And this is the attention score. That's kind of a label here. Uh, so we can see that uh, this green area is a listening, and this blue is resting, and this white is writing. Writing part is almost larger than listening all the time. Resting is the minimum. Some people, they took some subject, they took very small time for resting. After finishing, they just started the next task immediately. So resting task is very, very small. And all the signal were recorded at 140, uh, 128 hertz sampling rate. So that means we have 128 sample in a one second. And uh, so th this is a whole data. Uh, we have one uh, paper on this data set uh, that this title of the paper is actually this FIAT, which you can find easily and uh, which explains everything that I'm explaining here in, in much more detail. So collected data set, ha we have uh, 25 subject as I explained each, each this is a file structure of the data set if you download. So you'll find every subject, we have a signal file and the text score file. Signal file has these many columns. These are the EEG signal, PPG signal, and PPG signal also we calculated the beats per uh, uh, minute and interbeat interval. So also, and for GSR, we have a instant in, uh, instantaneous sample and low pass filtered signal, which is kind of a moving average. EEG signal is all, all the signals are already labeled with the noise level, semanticity and task. However, they are not labeled with the attention score which we for which we need to read this file. So this attention score is the one. So uh, here comes some of the analysis, which you might find very interesting and which I was just talking about the kind of finding that we have. So this is analysis only from the transcribed uh, responses of uh, a subject versus in the different auditory condition. We are still not talking about the easy signal. So this is the one field where we can actually use these kind of analysis. So here it says, uh, so this is attention score. And uh, this is how it depends on different level of noise, which is kind of very predictive. Like we, we kind of already expect this. When noise level is minus six dB, which is like very noisy. So attention level is very low. And uh, when there is no noise, we have a kind of a high attention. And still you can see that even though there is no background noise, that message is completely audible. Still there, a lot of a range is there that we go like attention level go down as, as, go, as low as 50%. And it goes up, like it goes to 100, but not always 100. So it depends on many other factors also. So it's kind of a positive correlation here. If we see with the length, which is, uh, which is kind of a new for this, that length of the message also dip, uh, affect the attention level. So smaller the sentence, quicker to get it. So longer the sentence, it's very hard for somebody to keep it, keep it up. So, and the another thing is semanticity, which was the kind of a new thing that we introduced just by inserting few extra terms in between to make it non-semantic. So it looks not much, but uh, statistically, it's a significant difference between these two. So it's a, if semantic sentence are easily uh, paid attention and non-semantic are not so easily understood or paid attention to. So from this, uh, these results actually, uh, so there are few findings. One of them is that this length, effect of the length, this effect of the length is most likely only for the non-native speaker. So if you're talking to a British person 
or the person whose first language is english no matter how long sentence you say they understand it properly it is perfectly fine for that but however for non native speaker because our brain kind of learned this as a next language as a second language so it has to decode everything and kind of uh, interpret every information that is coming in and that's why if, you, if the sentences are longer then for non native speaker it's not so easy to pay attention to so so from this uh, one of the find uh, this it it simply conclude that if you are talking to non native speakers try to use as small sentences as possible because small sentences are easily paid attention to now when we come to semantic and non semantic it's again a uh, kind of a different for the native and non native so let's say uh, now in semantic and non semantic the difference is only some unrelated word in between which is kind of a very similar situation <clears throat> so in a teaching so let's say that if if you are teaching and if you are giving a lecture on something and you use some terms which are absolutely unfamiliar for the students so for students these unfamiliar terms in between are exactly like the sentences that i have seen here so this is a non semantic sentence let's go in between there is another term which is not making sense in this between so if you use any terms any any scientific terms which are absolutely not familiar to the students they feel it like non semantic so whole sentence become non semantic to them and that's how they they lose attention so it is more uh, crucial for non native speaker than native so uh, to use the non uh, if you use some some terms so again the question find uh, the conclusion from this kind of uh, analysis comes that whenever you talk to the people try to use simple possible vocabulary try not to use jargon scientific um, terms and some complex term which are not very familiar for the students at least so this was another finding from that now we come to the one of my interesting uh, my favorite analysis that comes from this is this so it says that how semanticity is uh, changed how semanticity affect attention on different noise level so here it's a noise free environment and we can see the semantic and non semantic are making a huge difference so in attention level so if you are saying a semantic sentence a noise free sentence the attention level is going to be very high drastically high than compared to non semantic sentences however if you keep going on the Uh, like keep increasing the noise and if it is a very noisy environment like this minus 6 db then semantic and non semantic sentences are not going to make any difference they are going to be perceived equally so doesn't matter how uh, semantically correct sentence you are saying if it is very noisy environment it's going to be perceived exactly as non semantic sentences which which has lot of uh, subsequential uh, findings behind it that why it happens and what it happens like what what it triggers and all that so i'll, I'll try to skip those details right now so this is this is analysis just from the text so after collected data and this analysis we formulated four different predictive tasks from this this data set so now if you if you remember that we have uh, this this physiological responses we have different auditory condition and we have attention score right so primary task for this whole experiment was that can we predict attention from audit uh, responses only without knowing any of this because normally we don't know these things we don't know how much noise level somebody is experiencing what semanticity is experienced so we don't know these things so can we predict attention level just by looking into these signals that that's a one task we call that as a task one attention score prediction 
And that's, that's the formulation for that. Now, from the, this analysis, we already know that attention score heavily depends on the noise, length, and semanticity. So, so that's mean uh, this attention score is already uh, just a second. Let me go through. Yeah. So attention score is already depended by this. That's mean if you change the auditory condition, it changes a lot. And we have a very strong evidence for that. So if you don't know these conditions beforehand for any, any situation. So can we predict these, these conditions from the signal? So can we predict noise level, for example, this from physiological signal? So now here is the one different thing. It's not we are predicting how much noise is in the environment. We are trying to predict how much noise is being experienced by the listener, because there might be a lot, a lot of noise and the listener might be good enough to overcome it, right? So we are predicting noise level from the responses. And can we predict the semanticity of from this signal? That means, can we predict that is listener experiencing a semantically correct sentence or semantically not correct sentence? So can we predict it? And if and length is very tri trivial, so we are not going to predict length of the sentence from signal because length of the sentence is perfectly proportional to this. So it's, it's useless to predict it. So now once we predict these two things, we can use them to predict the attention level because we know that attention level depends strongly on these two things, right? Another uh, task comes from that, that we already know that there were three states of the task in each, uh, each trial. So if I go back, I'll show you here. So we had here uh, resting, listening, and writing, three seconds. So from the signal, can we predict what listener is doing? Is he writing, listening, or resting? So this is the, we call this as LWR task, LWR prediction task. We will keep using it. So these are the formulation of task. Uh, of course, we are not going to use this raw signal just as it is. We will extract some feature from this raw signal and we will use this feature to predict this attention level, noise level, semanticity, or the task prediction that what, what listener is doing. So now for feature extraction, uh, keeping this uh, whole scenario in mind, we, we made two kind of framework, or you can say it's a procedure for how to extract the feature, or what, what is the right way to extract the feature from Features, features can be statistical feature, wavelet feature, Fourier transform, any, any kind of features that you can think of, but how it should be extracted. So if uh, it, can be, uh, it can be extracted in two ways. One is segment wise and another is window wise. So segment wise is when whole listening, let's say this was a listening segment and we take whole listening segment and we extract some N features from that. And every segment has a different length and we just extract the fixed number of feature from that. So that, that's a segment wise feature extraction. Now, another way we can do it rather than taking the feature from all this like whole segment together, we can divide this whole segment into smaller windows with overlapping windows and we extract feature from these overlapping windows. And then for each each window, we have a like for for let's say that this particular segment we have many windows, and for each window we have n features we extract it. So again, we will go to uh, hands-on practice kind of thing where where you can actually see it how we can do that. We have already provided all the code to do that, so it's it's easy to do that actually now. So what kind of feature we could we do? Now, if, uh, if we are just looking into only easy signal, basically uh, in these studies, easy signal, this is a raw easy signal. And this is how energy in every different space of the EEG is there. So in classical study of EEG, it's mostly divided into these five frequency bands. 
this is called the delta so so sorry so it's a delta delta is a 0.124 hertz which is kind of a very low act uh, low frequency 4 hertz to 8 hertz is theta alpha is 8 to 14 and beta is 14 to 30 and then gamma is 30 to 64 so whole frequency band is divided into different frequencies uh, and uh, for our study, we also divide this gamma into two categories, low gamma and high gamma. We will, I'll show you that later. So we use that. So now uh, you can see that this is a raw signal and this is a very smooth delta signal. And this is theta, this is alpha, this is beta, and this is gamma. Now you can see before even we go for any kind of feature extraction and check the power or calculate the power in each band for each channel, you can see here this blue thing, blue sky uh, spikes. These are called the artifacts. So whenever we uh, deal with EEG studies, the most common problem that we find is the artifacts. And artifacts are something that we have to avoid. They are they are they call they are they come because of some of the uh, non-relative task or movements of uh, of the in the experiment. So if I explain it that so there are basically many type of artifacts. The most common are these three. This kind of artifact is the one which is uh, called muscular artifact when you grind a teeth. So you will see EEG signal which is which is which has grinding of teeth has nothing to do with experiment but if you're doing it so you get this kind of artifact and this kind of uh, sudden peaks are the artifacts which is called the uh, movement artifacts which if you suddenly shake your hand or if you stamp on something so you will see that EEG uh, your EEG signal gets like this which has nothing to do with the experiment so that's why we still again call it artifacts. And this is a, another kind of artifact, slow oscillating artifact, which is uh, eye blinking artifacts. So if you are blinking your eyes, then you will find this kind of artifacts in, your, in the signals. Now in literature, there are many methods to remove these artifacts, but uh, in this study, we, we propose a new method, which is called automatic and tunable artifact removal algorithm. We also sub uh, this this article is already published in Journal of Biomedical Signal Processing and Control. So this with this algorithm, we actually remove this artifact like this. So idea was this this approach was to not remove it completely because whatever the other approaches, the state of the art algorithm that are available, they they either remove a lot of part and we lose a lot of information. That's the one, one problem. Another problem that they need multi-channel. So if you have 14 channel, yes, they will process them together to remove the artifact. Whereas the, our alg algorithm works on each channel separately. So, and then it removes, it doesn't just remove it, it suppresses it. So that, and we have a three different mode that we want to suppress it, we want to eliminate it, or we want to attenuate it. So we different have the different mode for this particular algorithm that we, we propose. And here is a little bit animation for showing that. So that's a block diagram for this algorithm. We use wavelet packet decomposition. We have a different filtering method. Now, if you see here, so that's a tunable parameter that we have beta. So if you keep increasing beta, uh, this blue one was the original signal and orange is the red frequency. So you can see that it's keep suppressing smoothly. So you can see only the peaks are suppressed here. If you go with a linear attenuation, they are suppressed a little harder. And if you go with the elimination method, you will see that there is a jerky effect here. So it's kind of because it's eliminating the wavelet coefficient which has the artifacts. So it kind of uh, it's kind of a very aggressive, and this is very less aggressive. But beta is the controlling factor that you can control how aggressively you want to remove the artifact. So this, uh, this approach actually gave very good results compared to other state of the art algorithms. So 
we in this paper we we uh, we shown the results that if we use ic based approach which is independent component analysis so there are three different approaches for that fast ic informatics extended informatics if we use this however training accuracy goes for lwr semanticity and noise level and for transistor we calculated mean absolute error so how much it goes and uh, it, it, the results are with the k fold and we use six uh, frequent uh, features for each channel so six frequency band that that that's i just explained before so we had in total 84 features for each segment so now we have 144 segment one segment for listening one for writing one for resting and from that we are uh, we calculated six uh, six feature for each channel that's me 84 features from each segment and then we applied support vector machine and with k fold and these are the analysis for that and we saw that applying this method we, we improved a lot with uh, better than the not doing anything and even doing applying ICA. So this, this algorithm was better. And then we can see at the result for all the subject. This was the subject on, only for one subject, which is presented in the paper. And this is for the other subjects using the same approach. So we, we can actually do that right now. Now, that was the all predictive task. And uh, now there are some interesting analysis from the EEG signal. So do you have any questions or should I keep going? Sir, no, not no question still yet. Okay. There are right. only two questions which have already been answered. Okay, all right. So I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll keep going. Okay, so in uh, here, it, this graph shows that uh, which part of the brain, like the red, red is the high value, that means it's, it's uh, active. And blue is the low value that's mean it's very deactive, kind of no neural activity or no neural firing. So with this EEG study, we can actually see that, that for attention score, this uh, frequency band, which is zero to four Hertz or Delta, uh, this, this is called the prefrontal lobe, which is in the front of our nose. So this is a nose, so it's the front side here. So this particular portion is uh, firing a lot with, so when attention score, so when this fires a lot, attention score goes higher. That's, that's the meaning of this, this particular graph is. Now, if I go to this band, which is quite interesting, which is uh, beta, delta, theta, al which is alpha actually, yeah. So alpha activity has been, uh, in, in studies, it has been related to the relaxedness. If you are very relaxed, your alpha activity goes very low. That's mean like you, you don't, uh, no, so if you are very relaxed, then your alpha activity goes very high. That's mean your brain starts firing in alpha band. Alpha band is actually, is a kind of a relaxed band. So if you are relaxed, then the power and, and the energy of that band is high. And we, we got the similar kind of results here. So attention score here is a negative correlation. So it goes very down. So that's when, when attention score is going high, energy in this whole band in every electrode is going down, which means alpha activity is going down and attention is increasing. So alpha, alpha uh, it goes high when you are relaxing. So attention, paying attention is supposed to uh, relaxing. Similarly, noise level. So when noise level is very high, you kind of try to pay more attention, at least in this study, they try to pay more attention. So they were little more excited. So that's why the alpha activity was very low in that. So th this was the kind of analysis that, that, that relates and that kind of uh, goes similar with the literature. So, and another interesting that analysis that we got from semanticity is that for semanticity in uh, beta band, we have uh, this prefrontal cortex was firing and which, which kind of relates to the one of the study which shows that uh, prefrontal cortex is that, that fires when we are thinking a lot. We have to think and we have to process the complex thing. 
then then this prefrontal cortex which for the executive task it fires and for semanticity it fires so that's mean when when it is semantic it, it doesn't have to fire when it is non semantic it is firing because for non semantic sentence brain has to process a lot to understand what's going on and try to connect the relation so if you give a sentence which does not make any sense brain is still try to uh, find a relation between the uh, sentences right so these these analyses were very interesting some of them were uh, related with the all the studies that are in the field and some were new right. so not just svm we also applied this uh, deep learning architecture thing so uh, this is one of the architecture where we use a window wise segmentation a feature extraction for each the we calculated this sir your voice is not coming properly now okay see uh, your voice was not coming properly i, I think you were away from the system okay now is it audible yeah, it's it's not proper now. okay so and i can see one question in the chat section also sir right? yes yeah. which feature extraction is better segment wise or window wise it depends interesting question that i'll explain mm -hmm. which is uh, useful and when which task it is useful but i, I can actually go back now and show you so feature extraction this segment wise and window wise now we have a four task so if i go with the attention level this first task attention level attention is a kind of a process we are calculating attention based on the entire segment that whatever a listener uh, listen properly and wrote it according to that we are calculating attention so in for attention uh, task we should go with this segment wise feature window wise uh, feature extraction will not make any sense why because for uh, we know the attention level for this entire segment we don't know the attention level for this particular window so it's it's very uh, unlike not intuitive to use this but only one window to uh, predict the attention however if you want to go with the attention level and with the window wise uh, feature extraction you can use all the window for predicting the attention by using some temporal model like bayesian network lstm rnn then you can use the feature for each window and feed them with the temporal model to predict the overall attention that that for for the attention level now when we go for the noise prediction now for the entire segment we we provided the same level of noise so you can predict from the entire segment so you can extract the feature from the segment wise framework or you can extract feature from window wise because this small window also has the same level of noise as the entire segment so predicting a noise level experience by a listener from this small window is completely valid task but predicting predicting an attention from a small window is not a valid task now if you go to the semanticity semanticity is again is a construct of the entire thing because if the sentence the full sentence you can't say the sentence is semantic or non semantic looking into the just a half portion you have to see entire sentence so again for the semanticity the valid task is to use the whole segment you can use with the segment wise feature or if you extract feature window wise use all the windows to predict the semantic so not just one window with one window it's not a valid task for task at uh, uh, task listening writing and uh, uh, resting again window works very well because when somebody is writing it's writing for all the length and then if you predict with the one small window it's perfectly fine so it's so it's kind of a combination segment wise you can apply to all the task window wise if you want to apply then you can apply to uh, only noise level if you want to predict from the small window and the uh, this uh, for the uh, semanticity and attention level if you are using window wise then you have to use all the window in a one segment not just one window so I hope this answers your question.
curves as well. You can you can continue with your thought. All right. So now uh, this one of this paper that we just recently submitted. So uh, this paper is uh, it it shows that how we use uh, convolutional neural network with the EEG signal, and uh, we converted uh, this EEG signal into images, the stack of the images. So unlike three images, we have here six images for six band. So we have each each uh, like one image for this one band, which is delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma one and gamma two. So we have six images for this. And this stack of images is extracted from only one small window. And we have overlapping windows. And we call this as SSFI, spatio-spectral feature image. So we, we calculate the images from, uh, from EG signal, and then we use them to feed to neural network. Now, unlike the conventional neural network, here we have six channel as an input, not three channel, like RGB image. So, and it's a five layer convolution neural network followed by two fully connected layers and then output layer. So we, we trained it. We had pretty interesting results and we have submitted a paper. Um, I just didn't include all the results from that paper here. One of the interesting tasks that we have, the result we have is called the intersubject dependency map, which was that we trained a model. Uh, so this, this matrix is very interesting. So this here, it says that we trained a model on a subject S1 and we tested with all the subjects. And this is accurate. So heat map. So higher it is, the red it is, and blue is a cheaper. So, so this particular first row is showing you the performance of a model which was trained on a subject one and its performance on all the other subject, which is kind of a very interesting in BCI application. The problem that we have is if you are training a model on one subject, you can't use it on another subject directly. Why? Because every brain is different. Every brain folding structure is different. So uh, if a model which was trained on a one person's brain will not, will, might not work exactly same. And actually it will never work exactly same for another subject because of the different folding structure, because of the different experience everybody had because everybody's brain fire on the different thing differently. So that, that's one of the big problem with BCI application that we have. And whenever we train a model on one apply one thing, we, one subject, we kind of have to either tune for the another subject or we have to use a small data sample for them from another subject to tune it for that subject. We can't tune it or use it directly. So in this, uh, we call this intersubject dependency analysis that we want to see that how much uh, one subject, the activity in the brain of a one subject uh, matches with the another activity in the brain of another subject. So if you look in into the first row, uh, subject one is quite, so a model trained on a subject one is working a little better on subject 25, but very poor on other subjects. So which, which kind of uh, give the uh, conclusion that there is a matching between the firing pattern of the brain of subject one and subject 25. So similarly for all the subject we have. Now, one of the interesting observation from this matrix is that this matrix is not symmetric, which would have explained a lot of things, but because it's not symmetric, it's very new. So what it is saying is that if I'm training a subject model on a subject one and testing on a subject 25, I'm getting this much of accuracy, which is kind of orange around 70 or 80, right? Now, if I train a subject on 25 and test on this, it ideally should be same. If, not ideally actually, in one scenario, it should be same. If it would have been same, Right now, coincidentally, they look same, but it's not same. If it was same, then 
uh, for all, then this matrix would be have been symmetric over the diagonal. Upper triangle and lower triangular would have been the same, but it's not. So what we're just saying that uh, some of the feature from S1 can be used for subject 25, but for 25 subject, you can't use it for subject one, which we can see in much more detail in better view with the subject 19. So if you look at the subject 19, a model trained on a subject 19 perform very poorly on almost all subject, except itself, 19. However, so that means that if you train a model on any other subject, it should perform as so poorly on 19, but it's, it's other way around. So if you look at this particular column, 19, it's performing better on subject S1 and subject 11. So it's not all blue here, which would have made a symmetricity, right? But it's not. So feature learned from subject 19 are not useful for any other subject, but feature learned from another subjects are useful for subject 19. So that, that's the kind of a conclusion here. And which kind of a very interesting to, to show that how brains are entirely different than whatever we can think of. So that, that was one of the analysis from this matrix, which we again have submitted. So still it's, it's under review. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, we, the brain activity, which are very complex, we have collected a data set, which, which, uh, which consists Sir, of- yeah, Your voice was not coming for around 20, 30 seconds. Okay, am I audible now? Yeah, audible now. So was this part clear or should I go again? Was this part clear or should I go with again some explanation? All right, all right. I'll just conclude here. So for the conclusion, uh, Yes, yeah, so everything in, uh, that I explained here, we have a website for this whole project. It's called fiat on github.io, so we can, we can just go through it. We have all the resources and material we have shared it there. So even the codes which can help you out to start with and how to train a model, how to start with SVM and decision tree and uh, how to extract feature, how can you use the external libraries to do that. For this, you will have to install a library Fiat with Python. You can just simply install it with PIP install Fiat. And uh, we have uh, shared all the data set now. It's just all there. Uh, the related papers are also in that. So you might want to use it. And uh, now after that, I'll just go through the some of the tutorial that I have for, for using this data set. So if you have any question before we go to tutorial. Uh, I think there is no question, only I can see uh, the appreciation messages there. Okay. There are appreciation messages like uh, extremely informative session, very interesting metrics, kind of appreciation message. You can go ahead with your tutorial, sir. All right. So, how much time we have? We are left with. So we have sufficient time. It's only three thirty, and uh, the session is scheduled uh, till four thirty. If you want to take some more time, you can take. No worry. Okay. Well, I, I explained everything about this project, but I was just expecting if anybody have any questions, so I can just go through that before I start with that. Yeah, I can request the audience. The audience, if you have any question, you can write in the chat section. We are open for question and answer session now. Let's wait for a minute, sir, so that if anybody writes any question, I can take it from you. Okay. So far, I haven't received any questions. So, 
what i suggest so you can go ahead with your tutorial so later on we can take questions if there is any okay so i'll, I'll just go directly to the tutorial okay yeah. i think there is one question yeah one question from dr chandrakar how did you use early selection here uh, yeah so early selection is again it's a it's a mechanism so we didn't use early selection early selection and late selection theories were kind of a basic theory to start with the attention that how attention works so uh, very precisely we didn't use any early selection and late selection theory uh, these were theory to understand the attention mechanism and to design the experiment we we while designing we we take care of these theories okay so for the cnn there is one more question from chintan bhat as you can see in the chat section sir yeah can you go in detail for cnn in bci okay so cnn in bci i, I hope you are asking a question that how we can use cnn in bci or you are asking that how we use in this for this particular data yeah okay. i think how did you use okay so uh, well cnn with normally an eeg signal uh, e because it's a temporal signal uh, usually people use 1d cnn so 1d convolutional thing but for 2d we use 2d one why because we just converted this image into the uh, this uh, this is a stack of 14 channel into an image so that's how we used it so right now it's uh, this architecture is very simple we have just simply five layers uh, convolutional layer each layer is followed by the max pool and the uh, uh, batch normalization however we can use it for uh, much more in much more detail to understand that which part of the brain is actually uh, more common for all the subject that's what we did for that paper that we just submitted so in that uh okay so you're asking number of layers number of layers we had five convolutional layers and two fully connected layers plus one output layer you can see the architecture here no so this uh, okay this first one okay let me just go to that this first one is the input it's not the layer it's the input 64 by 64 by Six. This this particular input is here, and then we have five layers, and then we have two two fully connected layers, and this is the soft max last layer, right? So the one of the other analysis. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, you continue, sir. Actually, there was one okay. more question. I think uh, I think you answered the question, but. Uh, okay so uh for the uh, from the in uh, other analysis that you can always get from the cnn kind of approach is to uh, find the low level feature and high level feature that how what this uh, brain is looking uh, this neural network is looking into the these images and looking into these images what kind of pattern it is looking for particular task so we did that kind of analysis that's kind of a very extensive analysis that we did and we submitted for the paper which which kind of reveals that what kind of pattern uh, is as cnn is looking into these these images normally in rgb images you might have seen the uh, back propagation and guided back propagation approaches to find the features which they call it uh, deep features or uh dream deep dream dream kind of feature that uh, that shows that where are the uh, faces and which node is looking into faces which node is looking into the circles and like that right so in in cnn kind of approach it uh, for uh, eeg kind of approach it is little different so we don't have edges first of all like a hard edges so we don't we didn't get any kind of that kind of filters we didn't also get kind of a pattern that you normally get from rgb images which is which was expected but we got some interesting pattern which kind of uh, uh, match with the brain topology and we can see which part of the brain and which cluster of the uh, 
uh, image is actually uh, used for the prediction. Thank you, sir. And uh, I can see another question in the chat section. From the metrics, can we get any idea about the psychological stability? Oh, super. Okay, from the I uh, okay. So if you're talking about this matrix, this matrix is about the twenty-five subject and twenty-five subjects. So it's first of all, it's not about the one subject. Second, psychological stability is uh, it's a kind of a big context, and it, it depends on the which kind of context you're talking about, if which stability you are talking about. So if you're just talking, uh, for instance, if you're talking about the stability of person's performance in these tasks, listening, writing, and uh, resting task, then yes, you can see that how much it is related to other person and how different it is. But I wouldn't still categorize that as a stability or non-stability. Uh, I, I wouldn't be sure to say that, like even at looking into EG signal of any, any person to classify that person as a stable or non-stable it's only the one phenomena that comes is that uh, that's a that's a caesar thing right but other than that uh, it's every brain fire differently so stability i wouldn't classify that but in terms of how much it is uh, matching with other person yes you can see that you can see here subject 19 is uh, is absolutely different than other subjects and subject one is different. So another interesting point that uh, I can point out that subject 19 has the overall very low attention score and subject one has the overall highest attention score in all the subjects. And having a low attention score also kind of a, uh, says that why it's no others, like it's uh, learning anything from subject 19 is not applicable to any other subject because performance of subject 19 was very poor. So, so that, that kind of analysis, yes, we can get it, but not about the stability. Thank you, sir. There is another question in the text section. Can you suggest some other good deep learning algorithms for comparative analysis of the EEGC? Yes, there are many actually. Uh, you can use LSTM. LSTM is one of the very common thing that people use for temporal temporal signals. And uh, for given kind of a problem that we have, each segment of EEG that we have for listening and writing and resting are of the different length. So if they are of the different length, then uh, you can uh, use RSTM and LSTM, uh, sorry, LSTM and RNN much more effectively because they work with the dynamic length. Usually otherwise for the other, networks, other deep learning networks, you need kind of a, a fixed length. So either you pair with zeros or you fix them somehow. But then you can use the dynamic one. You can use the Bayesian network also, which is also very good for the temporal approaches. I think you have already answered the next question in our chat section, which was like how LSTM can be used here. Yeah, so LSTM can be used very effectively here. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, it's it's a long process to do for me because there are still a lot of analysis to do before that. So you yes. also get a feature direction. That's yeah, you can it. always, so that's, that was the whole idea to release everything in the public so that everybody can use it now. And we have given all the direction in the, in, on the web page so that you can use as many network, as many uh, things that you want, and you can even go with that. I can see one more question in the chat section, sir. So which algorithm would you recommend for speech to speech translation? A speech to speech translation? Yeah. Well, it, it has been a long time that I have worked on a speech, but uh, I, I don't know if people are using WaveNet as a, one of the pre-trained model for uh, extracting feature from uh, any speech. And, uh, but precisely, I don't know. It's, it has been long, long time that I worked on a speech. So no idea what's going on in that area. All that I can see are now appreciation messages. 
so we can uh, move to your tutorial section sir right so uh, i'll go to the tutorial so for that i stop sharing for now Right, so uh, this is the page that we designed to share everything. So in this page, you can see almost everything that we have, the experiment design that we had. So that you can have this paper. You, uh, it's almost everything is almost explained here. These are the four predictive tasks. We haven't shared the participant detail or the demographic because one of the paper which is under review with double blind, so we can't share those information yet. Data set detail is again here. You can again go through all the data set thing. And for downloading, the instructions are here, but again, I'll go through the instruction. Algorithms, again, th there is a paper here, the one algorithm that I described. We haven't implemented this algorithm in this library yet, but yeah, we are planning to do it sooner. And other analysis. There are the analysis of the spectral analysis and the some statistical analysis you can check with this. The most important part is the predictive in predictive modeling. So here we have given link to start with everything. So if you go to this uh, getting started, you will see that first you have to install this library and then how you can download the data set. If you want to download a data set of only one subject, or all the subject, if you want all the subject, then you can just do minus one and it's going to be all the subject. So I'll, I'll just go through the one of the example code rather than just showing you here. And also for the example code, you can actually uh, go from here. So um, let's start with this SVM. So if you click on this, you can actually launch it on the, is it visible? Is it visible, right? It's visible, sir, visible, right? Yeah. So if you click on this launch binder button, you will get to the Jupyter lab and it will, it will open there. So everything is all installed in the here. So you can just run out on the cloud and see it. So let it just start. If you have a system right now, you can just do it and you can see it all the time all, already. Yeah, sometimes it takes a little time. There are all the other example also. So other example also here. So if you want to go through them. Yeah, so this is started. I tried to explain almost everything here again. So I, I'll start running. So now it's running on the cloud. So you can just see, you will need NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib, and this Fiat library. Right now, this, this notebook works on the version 0.0.2. Uh, For downloading data set, we have, like, we have imported Fiat as PH and, uh, with the method download data. And uh, you have to give a path where you want to download the data set. If you don't give the path, it by default, it takes this kind of path already. One upper directory then where you are exactly. 
And here you can specify which subject you want to download data for. So if you say one, two, three, you can say one, two, or be any subject. Or if you want to download the data set of all the 25 subjects together, then just say minus one and it's gonna download all the subjects together, right? Purposity, I keep it open. And uh, sometimes if it has already downloaded a subject, it will not download again. So if you want to overwrite it for the fresh file, you can just mention true. So here I'll just go with the one subject data right now. So this down, subject is downloaded. Now, uh, the directory that you have given this, or you can check this file, uh, which, is, which should be ideally same, but sometimes if it is even different. So this is much more detail where it is. So you give this directory and that directory created this directory and another directory. So you can, it returns that path where exactly is your data. Or you can use the same path, it's fine. So now we want to read all the file that we have of the subject. So here again, I'm writing this, or you can write this. It's, it's the same thing, it's not a problem. And if you, so this is, there is a function read file. So it will read all the files and put into the subject order kind of thing in a dictionary. So if you read it, you, it will say how many subjects you have in your data file. And there's a text file for subject one which is the complete location of the text file where from where we will read attention scores and signal file is a signal file where we will read all the signals. Right. So now uh, for processing, we have created a subject here. So in this library, so you can just create a subject, uh, ph subject, and then you give the subject number. So, uh, this as this whatever you get written here, it's a dictionary, and I can show you. It. So it's a dictionary. It has like right now one subject. If I let's say go to two again, so I will have subject two also. One was already downloaded, and it will, it will have subject two also. So now if I check it, I will have. Two subjects, subject one and subject two. So when you create a subject, uh, this one object of the subject, so you just pass those file of that. So right now I'm creating a subject with the ID of one, subject one. I can I can say it two also because we have two subject two also. So right now we'll go with the one. It's visible to everybody, right? Yeah, it's visible, but your voice uh, gets uh, lowered whenever you get away from the system. All right. So till now, this is clear, right? That uh, you can download any subject by specifying here. Once you download, you can read all the subject files that you have in your base directory or the directory that was written here. You can check it here. So right now we have two subjects here. We can see it's a dictionary and it's subject ID and the files. Now I'm just creating a one subject here. So this subject, you can completely avoid it. You can just do it manually by reading these files, but this is just to ease the process for you. So right now, now when I just run this, this is gonna create a subject which will hold the files, the signal file and the attention score and everything. So right now, this is our subject. And uh, you can check it also. So it shouldn't say anything here, but this is subject. You can, you can see the other details of the subject with its functions. These are the methods here, right? Like uh, there's a file name. There should be a file. Okay, here is my file. All right, so that's the subject. Now there's a simple operation for filtering out. So first thing that we always do with the EG signal is we filter out with a high pass filter with 0.5 to remove the high DC components. That that's the first thing with the EG signal we do. So. 
uh, there's a simple one method for that. If you apply this filter EEG, so it's gonna only process EEG. It has all other signal also, PPG and uh, GSR, but we are just processing only EEG. So you can uh, define what kind of filter you want and what order of the filter you want. Right now it's a high pass filter. You can say if you want some other frequency like four Hertz or something like that. Or if you want, let's say one to four Hertz, you can just say one to four Hertz and this can be then band pass and it's gonna work fine. But let's go with the high pass first. So we want high pass filter of 0.5 frequency. So it's done. And uh, now if I want to, let's say I want to see the signal. So I can always see the signal. I can just get signal from this. So let's say that I want to see the And there is a function called get easy. And uh, let's do numpy. So we got this easy as numpy. If you don't say numpy, it will give you as a panda. So let's let me show you the panda thing also. So it will show you this easy signal with all the easy columns and the values. So if I say it as numpy. This is numpy array. And you can see the shape of that. The shape is that we have that many samples and 14 channels, right? Now, if you want to plot it, a quick plot, we can just plot and see it. Yeah, so you can see that's our signal right now. It is not so good, but that's how it looks like. So we can we can plot just one signal also if you want, right? So these are the all four. Now, uh, other than just filtering out, we process it also. So we pro we are removing the artifacts right now. Only one algorithm of artifact removal is there, uh, ICA based, but you have the many tuning parameter. Uh, I'll explain the tuning parameter later. Uh, right now, we'll just go quickly. So that be, that method name is ICA, and uh, which how much window length we want to get. So let's say that because we know the uh, sampling rate was 128 hertz, so that means we have a 128 hertz in a one second. So saying window size 128 hertz, uh, 28. That means we are just uh, processing one second segment of EEG at a time, and which will take a long time. So if I say 10, it's it's going to be a little faster. It won't be very good one, but it will be still faster. Just be fast. You can change the window size. And uh, so this is going to just remove this. So right now it's saying that it's using extension, uh, extended InfoMax method. I'll, I'll explain in the next next tutorial that how you can tune this to change other parameters to work with the different parameters to remove the artifacts. So once artifacts are removed, then we can do the all the all the feature extraction, task prediction, and everything. So still we are working on the raw EEG signal. We haven't done anything yet. So we just read the file here. We filter all the EG signal with this filter, and we are correcting all the EG signal with this method, ICA based method. We are not still, we haven't uh, extracted any labels or anything yet, which, which we will do soon once this is done. 
even the that this ic based method is kind of a very com, uh, computationally complex it takes a time and and the one which we propose is a faster one but we haven't implemented yet in this and if you want to use any other library for processing it you can always do it after extracting here from eeg you can process this e, this xc with any external library and put it back with the subject for the for the other task yeah it, it approximately takes 6 minutes if you have any question you can keep asking also because this is going to take little time so the only i can see are the appreciation messages now yeah i think there is a one question can we use pca and ica instead of so instead of ica we can use pca but for artifact removal algorithm it is ica based approach it's not pca based approach because uh, ic based approach is for the blind separation method and uh, so that's one of the classical method however internally i see all the ic method they use pca first to go to the ic component but pca component pca will not be useful like there is no algorithm for pca to remove the artifacts but ica yes there is a one simple technical difference between them so pca kind of uh, uh, decompose a signal into principal component which are orthogonal to each other but ica decompose into signal which are not orthogonal but statistically uh, independent to each other so that that's a small difference and they might not be orthogonal even so that that's a benefit here but they are statistically independent that's how uh, in eeg artifacts are usually removed however one algorithm that we propose it is uh, independent of ic or pc it's it's completely based on wavelet packet analysis so which is even faster you are welcome yeah we can go ahead sir uh, yeah i'm i'm waiting for this process to finish sure. I can see numerous application methods people have able to like a true Thanks. speaker. Thank you for everyone. Thank you for this really informative session. And uh, Dr. Chandrakash has also shared the link for your GitHub repository. Sorry, Dr. Chandrakash has also shared your GitHub repository link to the audience. Okay. Oh, okay. One of our participants has also said that live execution always helps us to easily understand. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So once it is done, I'll, I'll show you. This process is is going to take little little time, like for everything. So next process is going to take two minutes at least. I mentioned the time here just to. All right, so artifacts are removed, okay, with this. Now, uh, time to extract the feature. So, for extracting feature, the, here is we have task. We, we, we have method called the get XY and EEG only, and we specify a task. If you say task one, it's going to uh, extract feature only for the attention prediction. If you say task two, then it's going to for the uh, Semantic uh, noise level, and then task three will be for the semanticity, and task four for the LWR. And if you say minus one, it's going to extract feature for all of them. So, and we do the extraction process only once. If you do for all the extraction process for 
uh, task four or all the task ones, the next time you extract a feature for any other task, it won't reprocess it until you ask it to redo it because it will be again otherwise complex. Right? So we'll go with the task four, which will allow us to use the task one and two and three also because task four includes listening, writing, and resting segments. Whereas task one, two, and three includes only listening segments. So if you do task four, then we have feature for all the segments already. So we'll do with this. And the split of the data is done serially, which there is an option here you can actually choose to do it uh, randomly. But serial option is the only good option because uh, in temporal studies, what we do is uh, we do not predict uh, past information from future information. So that's why uh, out of 144 segment, 100 segments are feature from 100 segments are put into the training section, training, and the uh, rest of them have put into the testing for that segment. So I'll just run this. And it's going to be, this is going to be fast. So these are the first uh, listening segment of 100 segments. And then, so this is first training is going on, uh, feature extraction for training. Again, feature extraction are the same six features that we explained in the presentation. Uh, total power in six frequency bands for each channel. So we have 14 channels, six frequency bands. So in total, we have 84 features. So this is done now. You can see that for training, we have, and this is done segment wise right now because we didn't mention any kind of window here. So for each segment, we have 84 features. So all to, together, we have 290 segments which includes 144 of listening 144 of resting 144 of uh, writing which is actually for subject one it is 143 segment not 144 so this is a training set uh, data ship and this is a testing so that's how we got it right now if you go with the svm we'll just go with simple svm right now so for task four Again, I'm just extracting. So if I extracted this feature again, it's not going to take time because we have already extracted. So it has four extracted feature right now. So if I do it, so see it's just quick. And now we have again the same thing. And the class label we can see we have class label zero, one, two. Zero for listening, one for rest uh, writing, and two for now for applying the uh, SVM, we first always normalize it because SVM works very well for normalized data. If you don't normalize, it's going to be bad accuracy. And uh, classifier, so for normalizing, we are just calculating the mean and standard deviation and dividing training session, training data with mean and standard deviation of training and testing also with mean and standard deviation of training because to normalize, uh, date, test data with the parameter of training data, not the other way around. So for training, we are using this support vector classifier with RBF kernel, C value one and this auto. We just train it. And then here we just predict it. And this is accuracy for the and I it's going to be fast. So we got 95% accuracy for training and 86 for testing, which is very good because uh, random chances for accuracy for this will be one by three, which is 33. We are getting 86, which is a very good accuracy for three class problems. So that's what we got. Now, if you go for the uh, semanticity classification, now if you want to extract the feature for task three, so remember here, we had a four here and now we have task three here. So if you just do it, it's again going to be very fast. Why? Because for semanticity, we just need listening segments, not the writing and resting segment. And feature for listening segment were already extracted here when we extracted feature for, that's why I did it for four here so that we have feature for all of them. Now uh, we have two classes again here, zero and one, zero for semantic and one for non-semantic. We are going to apply again SVM with the same feature setting 
and we'll save the values here. So if I run this, we get 85% of a training accuracy and 62 of testing, which is also good because 50% of this uh, segment were rest uh, semantic and 50% of them were non-semantic. So worst case scenario was 0.5 and we are still getting better than worst case scenario. You can see, however, the data uh, size is less. So only one, 100 segment for training and 43 for testing. So it's because in L, uh, task four, we had three times of that, all the segments. But here we have only listening segments. So this was this. Now, if you go for the noise prediction, noise prediction, we are considering this as a regression problem, not the classification because we have six level of uh, noise. So first I expect the feature. Now, if we expect the feature, we got the same size, but the, the noise level we have is minus six, minus three, zero, three, six. And for infinity, we have a thousand in the data range, which is like, we can't put infinity. So now if you want to use this as a regression problem, a uh, thousand is kind of a very large number compared to others. So we just convert all the value of thousand to 10 just to be in the same range. So now we have new noise level, which are minus six, six, it's like minus six, minus three, zero, three, six, and 10. You can use this as a classification problem also, but because these number are ordinal, so it's a kind of a continuous value. Uh, minus six is less than minus three kind of things. So regression is the better option. We can always go for the classification. There is no tool that says no. Again, we now we are applying regression uh, support vector regressor rather than classifier. And again, same or everything same. So, and for evaluation, we are calculating mean absolute error rather than accuracy. So here we were calculating accuracy. We're just right. Here we are calculating mean absolute error. So if I run it, it's just, it's not good. It's very bad right now, but it's, it's okay. It's okay for the quick run. So training error, mean absolute error is 3.9 and testing is 4.7, which says that on the average, we are making error of four for training and almost 4.7 for testing. So if it says that, uh, it, it, if it predicts that uh, it's a minus six dB, that's mean it can be minus three also, like around minus three. So it's that much erroneous, but it's, it's, it's not bad it's still, it's okay. Now the task one, which was the main objective of the whole process, which we still do not have a very good performance yet, but yeah, so we will just go with that because it's it's a crude way of uh, doing prediction right now. We are doing it very crudely. We are just calculating six frequency feature from all the segment together. So it cannot be so good. So now if you see this uh, values that we have for training, attention level is this big, like zero, seven, 10, and up to 10, right? So again, this is a just a one for 100 segment. We have so different values, so we kind of quantize them in the zero, ten, twenty kind of thing. So we are making the new labels: zero, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, and there is no ninety directly hundred. So, so these are the now new value that we have, and we are going to predict this rather than actual value. So the actual value, it's very, it will be very difficult. It's a small data set for 100 sample, this many value. So that's why we are just doing this. You can do it other way around. You can divide all the score above 50 to one and below uh, 50 to zero and consider that as a binary problem. That can also work to say that if the attention is greater than 50% or lower than 50%, we, that, that also can be done. Again, we'll do the same thing here for the 
regression and we get this is as a performance which is not so good but it's okay now if i just plot all the performance that we have we can plot it so this is all we are getting for attention level this is m uh, this is training and testing for noise level these two are regression problem and these two are This is one of the quick way to do that. And uh, if you so, if you want to do this whole thing together as just a one task, so there's another here, this, which is the entire code in a one snip, and you don't have to like read on it or something. Rather than opening it all the again and again, we can just open this. Uh, this launcher here, which is kind of a Jupyter lab, includes all the file together. So we can we can choose it from here or we can just choose it from here. So this is for LWR task, and if you just run it, it's gonna do it in one day. Download the data, it will do everything together. Right, so this entire thing. Now the question comes with the how much we can change, how we can tune the parameter, what are the tuning parameter we have provided to do, how we can use for the frame, different framework, and how we can use the external libraries. So first I'll go with the tuning parameters. So let's open this. So if, if you click on this button, sorry, this button here, it will launch all the files in JupyterLab like this. So all the Jupyter Notebook I'm showing, they are here. So you can just start with that. So let's start with the tuning thing. So tuning the tuning pre-processing. So all the pre-processing that we have provided in this library, there are some parameters that you can play with and you can tune it to get better results or something. So we can, we can just try with that in this, this notebook. There is one cell which was deleted. Okay. So if you have already downloaded the data, you don't have to run this this function again and again. You just need to remember the base directory where all the data is. And so right now, first tuning is that you can change the filtering. Let's say that you think the LWR task only depends on uh, alpha range. So you can just say, okay, let's go with four to eight only. Or some people, they process the band pass filtering with 0.5 to 40 hertz. I just did the high pass filtering. But some people, they go with the 40 hertz like they just remove the entire gamma band for processing. So you can even do that also. But then make sure that when you're doing it, then the frequency, the feature in gamma band will be very low. So that, that's the one, one thing. You can always check the option for the help here. So I try to include all the help for everything. So this function, if you run the help, yeah, so it's just right now saying, these these three arguments it's fine now if you go for the artifact removal so artifact removal has a lot of process a lot of parameter for first seeing it then how it works and all we can always check this now Right, L. We'll see. So, what are the parameter we have, and how much we can change? So, method. So, when you have a, this function, 
So we provide this method as ICA. So method as argument ICA, WP and et al, we haven't implemented yet, but for ICA method also, uh, which kind of method of for ICA we can use? So there are four available, fast ICA, Infomax, extended Infomax, Window size, by default, it is 128. You can change it. And hope size is the overlapping of two windows. So it's for the reconstruction properly. And this window, which kind of reconstruction window we use it. But uh, I think you can just, uh, you can just keep it uh, as a default, which works very well. If you, if you don't give this as a like hope size, if you don't uh, uh, specify hope size, it will be always half of the window size. So you remember that we, last time we had a window size of 128 by 10. So by default, half a hope size become 128 by, by uh, times five. So half of that for the reconstruction. And so another thing that we have is this, these parameter for removing the artifact. This is a kurtosis uh, threshold and this is a correlation threshold. So the algorithm of IC that is implemented here for removing the artifact be, uh, does two things. One, it calculates the uh, independent component and calculate which independent component is above the kurtosis of threshold of two. If any component is above threshold two, it just remove it completely and reconstruct the signal back. Because uh, high kurtosis means it has a peaky, Peaky behavior and which kind of uh, in theory looks like the artifact. Another uh, parameter is correlation. So it calculates the correlation of all the uh, all the channel with frontal loop channel and any channel which is highly correlated with frontal channel will be removed and the threshold is pointed. So pointed that's mean if any co any co any channel which is related to frontal lobe more than 0 0.5, 0 0.8 correlation factor coefficient, then it removes it completely. So these are the parameter to control. You can tune these parameters. So for example, you can say, okay, I will just choose kurtosis threshold 1.5 and correlation 0.7 rather than 0.8, not to be very, uh, aggressive and you can use ICA method at Infomax, Picard or fast IC or extended Infomax is by default. So by default method is extended Infomax here. You can see, right? So right now we are going to correct it with the different uh, parameter. Again, I'm going to put it as a 20 for the fast process. You can make it again 10 for the, if you have and this, keep it this exactly same because it's for the reconstruction of the signal when we divide uh, EG into uh, windows, how we reconstruct is using humming window and overlapping method. So it's, it's for that. And that the summing and overlapping is completely fine. So you don't have to tune it. It's not gonna affect much. And then So this is the another parameter. Uh, to the time this happens, you can always yeah, check with the help function. And I, I try to explain almost as much as I could. So you can you can see the help function and understand most of it. Once it is done, then we'll just see the one classification and then yeah, window best and the well, these are the two methods for tuning the parameter. I see waste approach is artifact removal and filtering, right? Now we can, we can see how we can change. After this, we can just go through the same process. The extract feature for any particular task and train it with RPL. I see it's going to be same, right? I'll, I'll tell that time, I'll just go to the another thing, which is that how we can change a different feature extraction method. So 
in this notebook, we are going to explain how we can uh, use a segment wise feature extraction or window wise feature extraction, the one which we explained in the presentation. For that, the framework is already implemented, so you don't have to do it again. So, again, subject one, it should be already there. So we are filtering with this. Let's keep this exactly same which we had before. So once it is done, then I will explain how we can just do segment wide feature extraction and then window wise. And what's gonna change in these two things. Yes, this was working. Any question in between till the time this process is? Oh, I can see number of application messages in favor of your this practical session. People are oh, appreciating a lot that uh, you could. Uh, you have already shared so much material with the audience that they are free to use it and they are uh, uh, you can take liberty to use it without any glitch. Can extend your work. Yeah, exactly. That was the whole point. So in PhD, I couldn't finish everything. It took a lot of time to design the experiment, uh, cover everything. So it was a it, it, was, a, it was a huge project. So but we still have a lot of publication in process to finish this. Like we have a lot of plans and things, but then we thought like let's just release everything and let everybody to do it rather than we keep doing everything. So, two three more PhDs can be done on this. Sorry, so much. I think two, two, three more PhDs can be done in this work. There is so much of a scope. Yeah, the scope is a lot actually, and there are there are a lot of work that can be done. There are a lot of analysis, even from neuroscience background. There are a lot of analysis that can be done from this this data set, which which we have been planning but we haven't done yet. So it's like it's a work in progress. So all the participants who are in the uh, process of planning their PhD, you can also contact with the uh, later as per your convenience. And uh, I, I hope and I am sure that we will help you out. Yeah, that that's that's that would be great. Thanks. We still have some uh, master student working on some of the work. So yes, we are also doing it, but yeah, more people is better. Yes. And the good thing right now is that a uh, lot of work is not published yet. So if you get some good results with some good techniques, you can still go for publication because it's, it's, still, it's still not published and it's quite new. Everything is quite new. So a lot of scope that if you get any good result for any good techniques, you can go for publication very easily. It's completely new work. We have also been joined by our Dean, Dr. Parmanan, who is the Dean of the School of Engineering and Technology. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the code gets uh, uh, completed. May I request Dr. Parmanan to please say a few words to our uh, speaker and to our participants? Dr. Parmanan, are you listening to me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Welcome. I'm uh, audible. Yeah. Yes, audible, sir. sir. Audible. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nikesh. You gave a very live and uh, very enlightening your uh, session, and all the our participants are very happy. And uh, they linked very well to your thought process and to your session. And uh, everybody is enjoying and enjoyed also. This is already shown by the number of questions. I was just uh, part of this 
and that time also it was uh, question ses question answer session was going when the question sessions goes longer that clearly indicates that the session was very good and people are in really trying to learn and join uh, the lecture and since it is a last session of this fdp so i like to thank you thanks all the our speakers of course they are or uh, they are all on the virtual even then this is this was a wonderful i fdp involving very eminent and internationally known personalities experts of their domain and <coughs> every including out uh, participants from outsiders participants from the sada university and uh, people from the outside india must have enjoyed and uh, this abdp is really a uh, great and uh, our team has really raised the complete bar of the quality of the faculty development programs and surely whenever we organize this kind of fdp next time of course we will raise our bar again and of course we will get the participation maximum as we are having this time too and of course this is the uh, one of the good thing in all the sessions our participation is almost varying from 200 to 250 except in a very few cases the number of uh, attendee uh, came uh, to 190 in the rest of the sessions it was uh, somewhere hovering around 250 next time we'll uh, again we we'll try to engage many more and uh, many more participants participants and uh, learning will go on thank you so much uh, thank you to our complete team department of computer science engineering to take uh, this uh, very, very difficult task especially in covid time and they did it successfully thank you thank you and thank you arun also and your team ankur abhishek and dr gaurav uh, dr gaurav gaurav dr gaurav so and apart from you four those who are uh, really help you do in this uh thank you to all of them also thank, thank you, you. aruna uh, you also you. like to i think you will also you should uh, say something Yeah, actually, uh, the session is already uh, going on, and uh, yeah. because the code was running, so I thought that we could utilize this time, and uh, we will also be getting late for another meeting which you have in line. So that's why I thought I should call you right now. The session is still going on, sir. Session is still going on, and the vote of thanks will be delivered by Dr. Ankur Chaudhary. <laughs> at the end of the session sir yeah. may, may i now request uh, dr nitin rakesh who is the hod computer science and engineering department to say a few words dr nitin are you listening to me yes i am very listening i, I am hearing uh, professor uh, since the last session it was a wonderful interactive session and uh, Uh, the five day workshop which is exhaustive uh, session for the participants also team time it is a learning yes i think there is some network issue at your end in the dull period of this uh, uh, covid they are engaged in online activity such uh, activities they are actually motivational and all hello yeah 
Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Am I audible now? So there is a uh, lag in your lag uh, means uh, voice. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah, audible now. Sir. Audible now. So I am thankful to all the eminent speaker who have spared their time for all the five days, and uh, they have been attached with the participants. I am. Coming to know that uh, they are sharing their slides also, data also, responding to the participants very well, and the participants also um, have given a, a complete five day entire time for this learning phase. So this is a wonderful uh, both way communication, and uh, uh, we encourage such activity further also and look forward all the participants and especially our guests speakers. They must be contributing in some sense. Uh, to the Department of Computer Science, School of Engineering and Technology, Sharda University. Thank you yes, once sir. again. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Yeah. Now, may I request Dr. Nikesh to please continue with your session? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, you, sir. I was here, like this uh, IC based, uh, this was done, artifact removal was done. And uh, now for segment fe wise feature extraction, so I have run all of them together just to avoid the time delay. So for if you, uh, we already did this segment wise feature extraction. So if you don't uh, specify anything by default, it's going to do the feature extraction segment wise. But if you want to specify, it's called like if you specify window size as a minus one, so which will consider as a segment wise. So each segment will be taken and uh, extract the features. And hope size, none, none is, right now it doesn't matter here for this case. So I did it again for the task four. And if we extract the features, the size is same as we had before. These are the classes and that was the accuracy we got. Now for the window wise segment ex, ex, uh, extraction, we just have to ex, uh, specify the window size. We can, we can say window size as a one second, which is point 0.128. Uh, right now, let's for the fast thing, we can just say two. So for two, I have already run it. So it's, it's still running right now. So now you will see that for from each segment, uh, small window of two second is taken and with the one second of overlap. So if you don't say hope size, it's going to be uh, half of that. So overlapping of one, uh, one second has taken and we have uh, for all the segment from listening are considered as a listening segments and for writing and writing likewise. Like, so it, it's processing and we will see that uh, the data size right now is we have 1300 uh, sample for training and 500 sample for testing, which is a lot more than what we had before 290. It's because we were just processing one segment at a time and now we are taking the end device. So we have this many. Now, as I explained also in presentation that uh, window wise segmentation is a, uh, valid for LWR class, for LWR classification, which is right now we are doing. So we can, we can use all the small window to predict if it was listening segment or writing or resting. And we can see still we are getting 84% of accuracy, which is testing accuracy, which is good. That's been from a small segment of two second window of, of a signal, easy signals, we can predict that whether it was listening, writing or resting. So this is with the win, uh, window wise feature extraction. You can just have to specify the window size. And also if you want to specify hope size. So hope size none means by default half of that. You can even just do it, right? So that was the, these two framework that we implemented in this. Now the last thing for tuning process is the feature extraction process. So, <clears throat> sorry. so right now still only fe uh, rhythmic features are uh, implemented. Rhythmic means the six feature that we use. Uh, why we call it rhythmic? Because in the study, it's called the rhythms, alpha, beta, gamma, theta, delta, they are called uh, rhythm, easy rhythms. So we call them rhythmic feature, but it's uh, technically they are spectral feature. So these are the other parameters for the uh, 
uh, feature extraction, which again, you can just run the help to see. It explains that which task you want, feature, rhythmic, right now, wave data and spectrogram are not implemented yet. And extra sample, you can always, so right now, if you don't say anything, so extra sample are not, there are no extra sample which have been considered. So there are, you can consider some extra sample also. Like let's say that the segment start and ends, but you want to take 64 be sample before and 64 sample after. So like in the combination, like one extra thing. So you can, you can specify with the E sample Redo if you have already uh, ex extracted feature and you want to extract with a different parameter, then you can you can say redo as a true. Other thing that you can explain here, uh, specify here is the what kind of uh, feature uh, power spectral thing you want. So power spectral thing right now by default it takes a Welch method for periodogram with window of hand and scaling is a density, D train and periodogram. So these are the some parameter which are used to calculate the energy in a one band, which you can change and tune as you like. And you can still say, again, the windows and the hook size is the full same thing as for window wise or feature wise, segment wise, which extension. So this was the last thing only. Uh, I think we are almost done. Just last thing that I wanted to show that if you want to use external libraries or if you want to get a raw data in your hand and do something with it, so what you can do. So for that also there are a few function which are there. So let's say that you want to get EG signal. So this is a function for getting EG signal you can extract EG signal, GSR signal, or PPG signal from that with these methods. This is one of the easy signal you can plot. So GSR signal, we have two things, uh, instantaneous sample and this low pass moving average filter. And we have three sample, three stream of PPG signal. This blue one is the PPG signal. Uh, green one is the beats per set per minute and uh, this is a very small value that's why it looks like zero it's interval between the sample beats so and then you can process them with a separate library and then you can just put it back there and let's say that if you want to use our lstm kind of thing so right now we already have subject which has a data one so you can have the subject and let's say that you say get LWR, which So if you say LWR, it's going to give you a few things at back. Uh, let me just check it. So it will give you LWR is a listening, writing, and resting segment with attention scores and the column names. So these are the four things that you will get, or five things you will get and return if you run this, which now you can use for, and like now you have raw data in your hands. So all the listening segments are in L and their corresponding attention score is here. So, and the column in each segment looks like these. So these are the uh, columns. So you have the first four, fifth, 14 channels are timestamped, then first 14 EG and then PPG and then the labels are there. Now L is a list of the, li uh, list of the segments. So if I go with the first segment, which is this, I can just check this shape, which that many sample 25 column and uh, these 25 column are correspond to this. So let's say that I just want the easy signal of only first channel, first segment. I can just say, so I just need one, two, three, four, five. So these are easy signals of this. 
and corresponding. Now we have 143 segments here. So for all of them, the scores, 143 attention scores we have here. And others, uh, other labels, you can see with the column label that we have the other label also here. So this label M is the noise level, semanticity and the task. So let's get for this L0, I want to see what's the label for semanticity. So this minus two is zero, that means a listening segment. This is minus two, label T. Now to see the label S. So minus two. These are all semantic. This particular segment is semantic. So non-semantic, that's why its label is one. What was a uh, noise level in that, this particular segment? And uh, this is minus two. And noise level was thousand, that's mean infinity. No noise in this segment. So you can actually extract all the things with this LWR in your hand and you can use any other framework, any other libraries or any other thing that you want. So you, you can just like the signals will be, you will not be uh, just uh, constrained to use this subject thing. You can do it everything with other libraries or manually or whatever you like. So these are the all tutorial that we have. You can again go through in more detail if you want, if, if there is any confusion. Yeah, they are, these all files are here available. Yeah. So I'm almost done. If you have any question. Thank you so much, Dr. Nikesh. Thank you so much for such a wonderful session. People have appreciated a lot. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, it is uh, be there for uh, five more minutes with us, sir. Uh, yeah. May I now request Dr. Ankur Chaudhary to say the vote of thanks to deliver his vote of thanks to all the speakers and to all the participants. And we will also request all the participants to be there for just five more minutes. Dr. Ankur, you may please. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. Respected distinguished guests, distinguished speakers, participants, and especially those who have devoted time to grace this faculty development program with their online presence. The Red Set 2020 is now drawing to close. I, Ankur Chaudhary, along with my fellow chairs, Dr. Arun Prakash Agarwal and Dr. Gora Raj and Mr. Abhishek Singh Verma, take this opportunity to extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to all of you for your valuable participation in making this event a grand success. Rexet 2020 is an initiative taken to nurture the talent and promote innovation as per the vision of our respected Chancellor, sir. Sri P.K. Guptaji, who believes in outcome-based actions with long-term sustainability, with the continuous motivation provided by our dynamic pro-chancellor, sir, Sri Baike Guptaji, continuous guidance of our vice-chancellor, sir, Professor Dr. Sibaram Phara, sir, and enormous support of our Dean, Professor Dr. Parmanan, and head of the department, Professor Dr. Nathan Rakis. We have been able to host this international event through online delivery. We hope that past five days have been productive enough and we are sure that you must have gained tremendous knowledge from the different sessions organized during FDP. Cloud computing, artificial intelligence, IoT and machine learning are emerging day by day and we believe that through the, a wide range of keynote speeches in this FTP, we have witnessed a new ways to deal with the challenges faced in the current era. 
we hope that cordial relationship established amongst us during this FDP will further strengthen and furnish in the future. Any problem, sir? No. Let me tell you that total 531 participants from 251 unique institutions from countries like India, Canada, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Australia, Oman, Saudi Arabia, India, Nigeria, Nepal, and Uzbekistan participated sincerely in this FDP. We have received participation from top Indian universities like IIT Delhi, Yadavpur University, JNU, Jamia Millia Islamia, and IIT Dhanbad, to name a few. We also re received participation from companies like Amazon, Best Buy, Canada, Home Screen Network, Real Blockchain Development, including Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India. Besides this, we have participation from Arizona State University, Carton University, RMIT University, Australia, Muscat College University of uh, Petronas, Malaysia, and King's Khalid University, Saudi Arabia. During this FDP, we have witnessed 10 eminent speakers, scientists, and researchers from the University of Repute, including University of Melbourne, University of South Florida, USA, British Telecom Research Lab, ISI Kolkata, Machine Intelligence Research Lab USA, Edge Hill University UK, Thomson River University Canada, University of East London UK, Pitney Bowes Software India Private Limited and GMP SaaS India. Our heartful gratitude to all of them for sharing their experience with us over last five days. We hope this FDP was an enriching experience and proved to be a worthy platform for the development of ideas and vision for competing in the world of computer science and its allied domain. As the organizing chair, we would like to thank each one of you and please pardon us if any convenience was caused to you. All the best, stay home, stay safe. At the end, we want to do some announcement also. The announcement is basically, uh, we are going to organizing a FDP. We are going to NI organize one uh, conference that we want to launch here. So I'm sharing my screen. You can see it on your screen. And now I will request Arun sir to tell something about this conference. Yeah. My heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers who have who could spare their time from their hectic schedules. And I'm also very thankful to Dr. Nikesh, who is present with us. And I'm also very much thankful to all the participants for their patient and sincere listening, I will say. As Dr. Ankur said, and I already uh, wrote in the chat section that we have some more announcements to do. But the first announcement is that we are uh, planning and uh, we have launched this conference in the name of advances and applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the conference is scheduled on 29th and 30th October at Sharda University campus itself. And this will be a Springer sponsored conference, and the proceedings will be just in Springer only. And we are in the process of that. Uh, may I request Dr. Ankur to please uh, kind of mute yourself? I think my voice is going. Yeah. At this system, Dr. Uh, Mr. Adish, yeah. Thank you. So the, this is the first conference we are going to do at Sharda University campus and uh, we will be looking forward to you to finally submit your novel and uh, original research work to this conference and uh, because this is our first conference in the series, we'll be more cautious about the quality and uh, we'll be taking only around 200 papers out of which uh, the acceptance ratio will be somewhere around 25% only. So, I request all of you and uh, I also request all those who can uh, help us out in uh, reviewing the papers so who can uh, contribute to
to this conference as a reviewer they will also be requested to kindly share their uh, consent to us we can all we will also uh, throw you a mail for the same and uh, you can respond to that mail that in what capacity you can contribute to this conference and uh, in the month of february next year uh, we will be having another conference which will be an ieee conference uh, we are still awaiting for its approval by ieee so as soon as we receive the approval from ieee we will be sharing the call for paper to all of you and this is springer conference earlier we were planning to do it physically but now due to this covid era or you can say this covid period we'll be doing it online mode in online mode now so the location will be no bar you can uh, submit your paper and you can present your paper to online mode and i am really very much thankful with along with my team for so many appreciation messages which i could read in the chat section all of you have appreciated our efforts and we are very very thankful to you we are thankful to our the management who provided each and every support to us in organizing this activity and especially to the permanent of the committee of eight who were always there whenever we wanted anything or requested anything so with this may i now request of the ranpur to finally conclude the session dr nikesh so, it was really very interesting and people enjoy thank, thank you so much for accepting our invitation thank you so thank much you. for being part of this and last one thing we want to say that what we have committed that whatever material we are committed that we will provide it to the participants we will provide it to you and very soon within a week we will try to deliver you our certificates also those who have opted with certificate so if you have any query you can uh, visit our websites also and you all of you have our mobile numbers and email id you can contact us thank you so much being part of this event thank you so much thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you nikesh sir thank you thank you sir dr nikesh